Inktober, everybody. We are doing 31 days of scary movies, and today is day five. I'm your host, Melissa Forziat. I'm a keynote speaker, and my topic when I speak is something I call Take the Donut, which is another way of saying carpe diem. So it comes from this weird thing that happened in college where I left a real donut on the table, but it became an object lesson for me and what it looks like to leave opportunities behind. So now I want to take the donut. So here's the thing. Every now and then I do a take the donut challenge where I'll basically hold myself accountable to something I want to go after. I'll make it official and I'll go after it. But this time I'm actually opening it up to everybody. So here we are. We're doing 31 days of scary movies. And today we're talking about scream and i have a very special guest for this one which i'm so excited about um this is america lopez who you may know from big brother 25 you may know from being from debuting number one on the podcast charts for her podcast (laughs) america tells all you may know her from being a fellow brown university graduate you may know her from her previous take the donut interview with me welcome america Yay! Thank you, Melissa. It's so great to see you again and get to talk to you about scary movies. OMG, October. Happy October. I'm so excited. This is actually one of the things that I do every October. I will watch as many Halloween themed movies because I don't really do scary, but I'll watch as many Halloween themed movies as I can in those 31 days. So this is perfect. I'm so excited to be here. I am so excited you wanted to do this because I know you're not too into the scary stuff. So we're going to get we're going to get into it because I don't know. I think this is scary, but maybe it's not. I'm, my scary meter t- in transparency is totally busted. I've seen so many scary movies that after a while you desensitize yourself to them. So it's like hard to judge. So when you were like, yeah, I totally love to do Scream. I was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> don't do scary movies at all. When I was little, my older cousins tricked me into watching uh, Chucky, Child's Play. They told me it was Toy Story and I was traumatized. <laughs> And then this other time, so my parents don't really speak um, very good English. So we went out to Blockbuster and my dad rented what he thought was the Lord of the Rings, but it was actually the movie, The Ring. So we're watching it and (laughs) I think he got, I'm sure he got that it was a scary movie after a while, but I had no idea. So again, those are like the only two like hardcore scary movies that I've watched and it's a no for me. But I recently got into the Scream franchise. It was during COVID. I had a lot of time. I was like, you know what? Let me give this a shot. And I watched it and I loved it. I, so you've seen a bunch of the films of the Scream franchise. I've seen the whole franchise since. Awesome. I think I watched all of it back in 20 or like whatever there was at the time. Because I know they're still releasing movies. But I, I love this franchise. I, I love it. It's my favorite. Ooh, that's cool. Okay, so we can dig into that as we get into the film. Um, So uh, so for background for people, this is Scream from 1996. This is the first in this in this franchise. It was a slasher for sure, directed by Wes Craven, who also did Nightmare on a Nightmare on Elm Street, the first one, and then like came back for a little like a little bit of a role in number three and then came back a little bit later for another film in the franchise. Um, We've got Kevin Williamson was the writer. And then uh, a cast that to me, everybody's famous now. Uh, we've got Nev Campbell as Sidney Prescott. We've got Courtney Cox as Gail Weathers, David Arquette as Deputy Dewey, Skeet Ulrich as Billy Loomis, Matthew Lillard as Stu Mocker, Jamie Kennedy as Randy, Drew Barrymore as Casey. Um, we've got Roger Jackson as The Voice. Uh, and just for the sake of it, uh, continuing, <laughs> Rose McGowan, who's Tatum, and Henry Winkler, who's Principal Hembry. Most of the time when I tell people, like, the cast in these, you do, it doesn't go on as long. But this had, like, so many. Yeah, yeah. it's just absolutely packed. Um, in this series, as America was just referencing, there's a Scream 2, 3, 4. There's a 2022 sequel called Scream. Not a remake. It's a sequel. Uh, and then a Scream 6 so far. And Scream 7 we'll see uh <laughs> yeah i heard that's in the works <laughs> it's in the works it's been in the works for a little while um but i also think it's worth noting uh there this film really sort of reinvigorated the slasher franchise or the, sl- the slasher uh, subgenre so a bunch of movies came out after this that were definitely inspired by like the fact that scream had done so well so from like 97 to 98 we get i know what you did last summer i still know what you did last summer the faculty urban legend the curve so this like started a whole thing right around the same time um and so yeah it's it's a like a really 
like a cultural phenomenon in a couple different ways. Um, but okay, so, and and just so it's been said, we're going to spoil the entire film in this <laughs> video, okay? We haven't yet, but we will, and it's gonna come fast. So be ready, uh, but watch the movie first and then come to this video if you're like not so sure. Um, okay, so America, <laughs> I had all these movies in October and I was like, I don't know, which ones are you thinking? And you were like, Scream. So what makes you love this one? I was like, Scream, please, definitely. I think because it's got, it's so meta and it's got, I think, like a lot of pop culture references and it sort of makes fun of itself, you know, and the whole like horror genre, I think is like, like it's a little bit lighter for me and I'm, I was able to watch it because of that I can't watch like anything that's super scary because it's like you know demonic and all that stuff this is like it, it's lighter I think it's fun and of course uh spoiler like you can't trust men you know and it's like oh the boyfriend did it it's like you so obvious and I, I I'm into it I, I really liked it yeah um so we know that you've seen the sequels. I think talking about the meta piece of this, we're going to, every October review has been approached a little differently because every film feels pretty different from each other. This one, we're going to take sort of a meta approach to talking about it. And I think the meta part of it is what makes this movie so impactful and the entire franchise. Because uh, like, if you think about the whole franchise and not that I'm, tr I'm not trying to spoil the future films for this, but like, when you set the tone with this one and then you're like we're going to do an entire movie that's really self-aware and very clear about it mm -hmm. and then you start making a two a three a four and a five you have to build on that somehow and they start you sort of write yourself into a corner with it and they didn't like every film you're like now look what they did here <laughs> you do such a good job it only gets better honestly like the sequels always suck and then I was like I love the sequel and then I watched the third one I was like oh my god this is so good and I've watched every movie since because it it doesn't like crash you know and it, and it, it feels like it well. should it feels like you shouldn't be able to keep this gag going and then yeah. it does and how far and can it... they really take it and they do yeah. they do a super good job yeah so creative so inventive especially when you've got different people like running the different movies that they're able to like drop into the same exact vibe of it that they did for the first film is just outrageous i also just like as a general nod before we get into any scenes um nev campbell who had been in party of five she had been in some stuff that was really well known but then like this took her in like that she's also well she's just scream you know like she's done all this other stuff and then she's like the scream legend and um she's my probably my favorite final girl um when it comes to because you know in in slasher films especially you'll see this trope of like the last woman standing is the final girl and she's sort of your hero uh but she was so smart and she you know like she's just so such an emblem um, mm -hmm. And I love that this film has that. She's so badass. Like, I love her. And I didn't know her from anything else before, but she's just cool. And she's, uh, I don't know, like, she, she's just a cool girl. I really like her. And she's kind of ruthless, you know, at, at the, we'll see that at the end when, you know, like in the final scene, she doesn't take any, anything from anyone. Yeah, I mean, it's just she's so capable and she's smart and she has compassion, but she she gets it done. Um, and she's and like what's so funny is I've seen some sort of like Comic-Con uh, like panels with the folks from Scream and she like she herself, she's like, yeah, I don't do scary movies. <laughs> and it's just like she's so comfortable in who she is when she is at these conventions and it feels like it comes across in the films also, which I think is why people, one of the reasons why people love her so much. Um, and the other thing I wanna say, and it, I think it's worth noting, like there's an age gap here between America and I. So I think that actually makes this more fun because this was like, I very much remember this coming out and America came to it a lot later. But um, like one thing I remember is that this was just instantly iconic, like immediately. Um, you knew what it was right away. And I think for you, America, coming in, what's the vibe of it? Yeah. I mean, I didn't even know Ghostface. Obviously, I knew Ghostface. Kids used to dress up as him for Halloween all the time. And I, I didn't connect it to the Scream franchise at all. I just really wasn't into scary movies like that. I wasn't aware of 
what bad guy was where. I still couldn't tell you where Freddy Krueger is or, you know, um, <laughs> did I even say that right? Is it Krueger or Krueger? Krueger, yeah. Kruger. Okay. Yeah. See, I don't even know the names. It's all good. I can tell you what movie <laughs> that guy belongs to. So I had no idea, but I knew like this face was like iconic. Right. And I knew the phone scene was iconic as well. The opening credit scene. I'm like, Oh, I've seen this before. I don't know where it goes, but the iconic blonde wig on <laughs> or blonde Bob on Drew Barrymore is like such an iconic scene. And I was actually wondering, I'm like, oh, I wish I was around in 1996 to go to the movies and see this live because I heard that while they were marketing marketing and pr promoting the movie, they were sort of like trying to make it seem like Drew Barrymore was the final girl and they were slapping her on all the posters and that's why she's, you know, she's the face and all of that. And then they sort of like tricked you when, you know, she's gone yes. in the first 10 minutes. That's totally what happens. And this is the perfect set. This is why you're like, you know, debuted at number one on the podcasting scene. So uh, like, yeah, Drew Barrymore, just by putting her name in the movie, you imply that she's going to have a pretty significant role in this film for the duration of the film. Uh, and so when she's off in the first however many minutes, you're like, okay, it <laughs> catches you very up. Like, it's not the first horror film to have a death at the beginning of the film. But I mean, it's such a big, like a a a list celebrity, <laughs> like yeah, a like draw, she was a star, a right? Film. Like by that, yeah, she was big. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, she was m like a major child actor. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking like ET level child actor. So by the time she's this age, like she's done a lot of stuff. She's probably bankrolling some. Th like there, there are probably some films that got funding because she was in them. Um, yeah. that's the status. And then, so to say she's in your film and then be like for five minutes, you know, <laughs> like it's so <laughs> tricky and risky and like this really funny bet that they made on the movie. Um, but yeah, like everything about what she does ends up being really iconic because like we, we instantly set the meta tone of the film. It's referencing a lot of other horror movies. It's making a game out of killing her, um, mm -hmm. Like there's just so many things about it that you come away from her part and you're like, yep, that's what this movie is. So like, you know, we get the, what's your favorite scary movie straight away. And people ask Nev Campbell this in conventions, I guess all the time. She's like, yeah, none. Uh, she probably <laughs> she gets has it all like, the time too. She's so annoyed. She has one answer that she gives like every time. And it's like, I can't even remember what the answer is, but she's like, um, I'll just say this again. And <laughs> <laughs> like, just like I don't do these yeah. Yeah. um which makes you really think about how different it must be on set when you're making them versus what it's like to like watch them as a consumer of it um but we're gonna get in this scene as well we're gonna get references to a bunch like he's so the, the the voice on the phone is gonna make it a game uh, why she stays on the phone with this person I don't know like if it were me I'm like wrong number I don't even answer <laughs> if I don't know the number I will not answer and you know this is where okay well we don't she didn't have a cell phone she had a landline mm -hmm. phone and that's different but mm -hmm. um they yeah, don't have caller ID yeah they don't have caller ID and they've done a good job of incorporating cell phones into the modern movies um and the more modern films but yeah they were a little confused about how cell phones work in this film they were still <laughs> we were still working it out so it was like okay um yeah, it's something that they had to grow with that into the franchise, which I think it was helped them to like sort of continue to make it more meta in new ways because um, communications were different. Um, but yeah, so we're going to get references to um, Halloween, the guy in the white mask who stalks babysitters. Uh, they're, they're, he, this guy's doing like a quiz with her of, of about scary movies. Um, and then we reference Nightmare on Elm Street for the first time. We're going to get a lot of Nightmare on Elm Street references because Wes Craven did this film and that film. Um, and and they they throw shade straight away, which again also helps you know. They say the first the first was good, but the rest sucked. Um, this is like okay. <laughs> Like, we know what's happening here. Um, also, I think it's worth for those who are like really into scary movies or want to learn about them or you want to find some other things that are being featured in October. This whole thing kind of is a little bit of a nod to When a Stranger Calls from the 70s. So like, 
that has like a really powerful opening 20 minutes. And if you just see the first 20 minutes, you can feel like you saw the whole, whole film, but it's very much a phone call situation happening there too. Um, so I think like one of the iconic lines from this is like Drew Barrymore walking around the kitchen and then like thinking this is a cool enough conversation and then hearing, I want to know who I'm looking at and being like, uh, I'm in a house full of glass windows. Um, <laughs> so many doors too. It makes me so bad. I'm so, I'm so anxious with her. I'm like, oh my God, why does she have to be rich and have this big house and have all these doors? People across America just getting drapes everywhere. <laughs> Run on like blinds and drapes at the store. Um, and you're right. Like the houses in this movie are so like the property is amazing. There's just like farmland everywhere. So pretty, yeah middle of nowhere too yeah middle of nowhere very important to set the stage for a horror movie as well um so uh as we're going through um the voice now is like no no no. you never say who's there you might as well just go investigate a strange noise or something so again we're like setting this pace of like we're gonna get randy later telling us the rules of horror Mm -hmm. films and like it's just setting us up for that like here are things that you do and do not do and in scary movies if you want to live um so yeah basically uh we've got all that happening there we're gonna get boyfriend steve tied up and killed she's playing a trivia game the the question she gets wrong is the entire spoiler of friday the 13th like sorry (laughs) if you didn't see that before you saw this because um it's given away um (laughs) and then um the bonus question is what door am i at and i feel like they play with that a lot in like the future iterations of the future um sequels of this franchise mm-hmm. so we we're gonna get drew barrymore getting killed as her parents are coming up um or i should say casey uh so it's just like you know she's strung up it's so violent it's so like i don't know it's just and then she's gone yeah it, honestly those first 20 minutes so iconic that's the one part where i have to like sort of cover my eyes because it does get gory so the first time I watched the movie I think it was on like freeform or like it was on like cable so they didn't show that part so when I was like watching it again on my own on like HBO I see the guts and I'm like oh I don't remember this part maybe it is scary scarier than I remember but yeah I guess that is one of the goriest parts of the film and and but you persist it's because they tricked you with the edited version which is ironic (laughs) Um, <laughs> that's how it goes though and if anybody who doesn't like gory stuff or seeing guts find like a free form or a tnt i think online whatever i think one of those platforms has like the censored version which so I it's, think- this is like so funny that you say this because the very next scene we're going to meet billy for the first time and he's going to sneak into sydney's bedroom and like the whole thing is is that she's like she's not putting out at all she's a virgin like I don't even know what if they're doing really anything at this point and um he's like yeah I was watching the exorcist and it made me think of you she's like I don't even know like this is this is the red flag that you needed folks um don't do it okay but anyway so uh he has this whole the whole scene is revolving around the like edited edited for television version of that film and the ratings levels and the ratings level of their relationship. Um, so it's one of those things that like, even if you come to it later, we still have those ratings. So it feels like, <laughs> oh yeah, I know what this joke is. Um, but yeah, so I guess it's even funnier knowing that you came to it because you saw an edited version. <laughs> pg version so i was like oh this is fine this is this is what a slasher is i can do this Mm -hmm. oh my gosh so okay we're gonna go to woodsboro high school we need to see the school for the first time there's a ton of media around because two kids were just killed and we're gonna meet gail weathers courtney cox who had been in she friends was already like uh you know like it had been running for a couple years at this point so people knew courtney cox this was a big get um but we're gonna meet Tatum Sydney's friend we're gonna she's gonna learn about Casey and Steve and then we're gonna start dropping this reference to something really dark happening in Sydney's past like in the past year and they're just gonna keep getting us little pieces of this so they're like oh you because you're the daughter of dot 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 like they're just gonna make us wait for that but you can tell there's some backstory here where people are like kind of handling her with kid gloves um Mm -hmm. 
And we're going to meet Deputy Dewey, Dewey too, uh, who is David Arquette. And in real life, Courtney Cox and David Arquette ended up getting married. They met, I, th I think they met on this set. So um, it's just so yeah, much I happening. I think I forgot about that. I think I might have known about that when I was first looking up the movie. So they were actually together. Did they, they married. Divorce? They I'm did. Not, assuming they divorced. Right? I, I think they were together for a pretty long time, though, before they divorced. Oh. Um, I and, love them. And they're, But they're like, they after they divorced, they still did screen movies together. So it's like, oh. And then recently, that's right. Well, that's yeah. good that they have like a, a good relationship, right? As it should be. They're adults. Like, yeah. Uh, good for them but i love it it's like you know there's all this stuff going around sydney it's very dark and then you have like the the romance in in doing gail and i'm like rooting for them the entire time yeah they're when they actually start flirting it's like oh come on get these two together stat <laughs> um we're gonna meet a whole bunch of the whole gang of friends pretty much outside of the school they're gonna de they're gonna basically go through like it wasn't an interrogation, but the, 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 they, they questioned all the kids in the school to try to get more information. And so all the kids are going to get together and we're going to see Sydney and Billy again. We're going to see Tatum, her friend, and then we're going to meet, we're going to see Stu, who's dating Tatum. And we're going to see Randy. We find out Stu used to date Casey um, before she dumped him for Steve. So, okay, that's like, oh, <laughs> like we're already planting some things here. Um, uh, so... Matthew Willard is such a bold choice in this film. I love him. Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask, like, he's he's big. He's very big in this film. Yeah. Was he big in the 90s, though? Because I know him from the Scooby-Doo movies. He's my Shaggy. But that was much later. I think that was 2001. So I know I him know from this. Him from this? Yeah. He's so unhinged. Like, you can tell just the way he acts and talks and his mannerisms. Oh, like... You know, and I've always seen him that. since and stuff that's more serious and he does that well. Um, so it's like, it was such a, like you told, like people were constantly quoting lines from him because it's just so over the top. It's like, it either really doesn't land for you or it lands <laughs> perfectly. Um, we'll get to more with Randy later, but so we've kind of met just about everybody. Um, we're going to, we need to start like sort of moving things forward here. So uh, we're going to get again references we're gonna get this like cat people-esque jump scare with the bus rolling in um so it's a small detail but it reminded me of that film and then Sid's gonna get home uh she's on the phone with Tatum she's like so much deja vu and you're like but why what's the deja vu for and then they've finally like gotten us to that point so we're gonna see her watching media coverage from Gail Weathers we're gonna find out that a year ago her mother was raped and murdered in the town square or left in the town square. Um, so so it puts a lot of this into context that she'd be like pretty tra traumatized by what's happening right now. Um, and then one of the things that this film starts doing here and is gonna be really played with throughout the franchise is like the, I'm gonna open a door so that the audience can't see what's behind it and just leave it there for a while. And you're like, ah! <laughs> Something's behind it. Something's behind it. They do that so much, and they get me every time. I don't. I. <laughs> they can do it five times in the movie, and I'll still be like, "Oh no, what's gonna what's gonna appear? What's behind the door?" But it's crazy it, how you know exactly what they're doing, and it still somehow creates tension. <laughs> it's crazy. I love it. So good. Um, okay, so Tatum's gonna come over, but first, Sydney's gonna get a call from The Voice. Do you like scary movies, Sydney? It's like, oh no, that's his shtick. Um, <laughs> And then, um, but this is where I sort of fall in love with Sydney because um, first of all, she's like, I don't do scary movies. They're all the same. Some big breasted girl just runs up the stairs instead of going out the front door. And then she's going to do that in like three minutes. Yep. Um, <laughs> but he's like, I'm calling from your porch. She's like, oh yeah. And she goes out and I'm like, I would never, ever, but what a ballsy Move. she seems so self-aware right but she's also very that was dumb like are you kidding me why would you do that? <laughs> like uh, especially with the whole you mentioned like we figure out like her her story and her background and the the one year anniversary i think of her mom's death is coming up so she should be on edge and instead she's like oh yeah shut up bye you know like, like, i just think you're randy it's fine don't worry <laughs> like, 
what kind of friends does she have that she thinks they're like pranking her like that yeah i mean some compassion folks i mean when you got a boyfriend like billy i guess it makes sense yeah um but yeah so we're gonna see no but ghostface is actually there but he's hiding in the closet so when she comes back in he's gonna pop out of the closet they're gonna they're gonna throw hands a little bit uh she's gonna run upstairs instead of at the front door um she's gonna barricade herself in a room this part i find really interesting because um she doesn't he cut her phone line so she doesn't have a dial tone but she has this thing on her computer that even though I'm from this time, I don't remember this. It's it's like a deaf typer that connects to 911. Yeah. And I don't remember. <laughs> I guess it was if they're saying it was a thing, but I don't remember it. And I don't remember if any of the sequels have this as like a thing that she did on the side. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know who in her life needed this. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't really remember, but I do remember her typing 911. Yeah. And then being like, what do you need? What's your emergency? Like, what? It feels like a mid 90s PSA to the world. Like, get on it because. <laughs> <laughs> like an ad. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, we're going to get Billy at the window for a jump scare. And then but he's with her. He hears her screaming. The phone falls out of his pocket, though. So now we're instantly like, ooh, it could be Billy. Mm-hmm. So we're just looking at him sideways for the whole film. Good news is Billy and Stu already worked this out. They're going to throw some red herrings in there for us. Um, so yeah, she's going to run out of the house. Dewey's there. Billy's going to get arrested. And then we're going to see her at the police station. Everybody thinks they're dead. But they are going to, <laughs> they're going to question Billy because he's there. And they're like, what are you doing with a cellular telephone, son? Like <laughs> anybody who has a cellular, cellular telephone must be suspicious um <laughs> it's so how, okay it's so, so dated they're like why do you have a cell phone like you're not you know what? and also to use the word the cellular like every time um <laughs> it's like uh, i don't uh, remember that that's funny i gotta next time i watch it oh yeah i didn't catch on that oh my goodness Please. yeah um so okay watching it being younger than me not from that time period like what what are you thinking when you see stuff like this that's outdated? Well, I don't, I'm like, oh, this must have been so fun. Like, no phones, right? We always say, like, oh, it, it must have been so fun in the 90s. Like, they were all just living in the moment. And then I guess you watch scary movies and you're like, oh, this would have been solved with a cell phone. Like, this whole thing, you know, she could have just dialed the, uh, taken pictures, like, I don't know, something. Dialed the police, find my iPhone, because if her and Billy are you know, dating and her and Stu are besties and they should all have each other on find my iPhone and she would know where they all are. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I, I I guess I just, I don't think about it too much. I like to just, you know, immerse myself in the experience and in the time. And I was like, oh, it's the nineties. This is, it's kind of funny. It's a part of it. And I think it makes it more interesting. Yeah. And it's, it's also kind of cool because thing tech was changing fast at this point. So like, things are wildly like radically changing for the sequels that come after this um and it's like it was really that fast uh so like they did the best they could here to work with what they had but you're you're in this one you're like okay check the phone records like that's a thing we can do with cell phones or cellular (laughs) phones like I'm also thinking why aren't the cops like like getting DNA (laughs) they have a mask (laughs) It's right. like where it all falls apart for me in this film, but it's okay. Like it's, you know. I it's... always just assumed it was because it was like a small town in California and maybe they didn't have the the equipment, you know, for it. And I don't know. That feels like a really good answer. I'm going to go with that. That's my new, that's my new way to solve well, this like, problem like, for myself. Was... I don't know much about California, but they seem, they look like if they're in the middle of nowhere in like Northern California. So they do. I was like, they probably just don't have. So they don't dust fingerprints or like, well, I guess there wouldn't, well, you have to put the mask on somehow. Anyway. uh... (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness. It's such a good answer. That's my new, that's, that's the move from now on. Okay. Perfect. (laughs) Solving problems left and right. America Lopez. Okay. um, So uh, I love that we get 
just all of these little nods to how Dewey is so young and like Tatum doesn't take him at all seriously. She she gives him the old I'm sorry, Deputy Dewey boy, but we're ready to go <laughs> in front of us. So old. old to me. I never got that because I'm like, this man's like 40. What do you mean? Like he looks like a grown adult, and she's like, maybe it's the mustache that makes him look a little it's bit probably. old. But you know, I love a good mustache. But it, it was like. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, she's like, oh, whatever. I figured, you know, they're like siblings, so they're like bickering a lot. I, yeah, <laughs> I love. Yeah, you. I mean, it's so cute, and it's it's like part of the reason why things work so well with him and Gail because she takes him. At first, she's using him, but she eventually takes him seriously, and it's like finally <laughs> somebody in my life. <laughs> um, so uh, we're gonna see that there's been conflict between Gail and Sydney. Uh, because Gail wrote a book about Sydney. We'll find out a little bit more of about this, uh, like in a couple scenes. But she wrote a book about Sydney, and Sydney's gonna slug her in the face because I get this. This is like the first time she's really been able to encounter her since then. Yep. But we're gonna get more. This this film just sort of like drips a little bit of information at a time, and you always know it's important. Um, but they actually layered in a surprising amount of stuff that would fuel their future movies. So. Um, we are going to get Sid sleeping at Tatum's. Billy's going to call her from jail. Um, uh, well, she, no, no, no. She gets a call from the voice. We don't know that it's Billy yet. Okay. okay, okay, um, okay. And Billy's in jail. And the, the voice is like, you fingered the wrong guy again. Um, and she's like, oh man. So it's probably what the thing with Gail was about. Um, yeah, but then at this bump, at this point, you're like, oh, this clears Billy. It does like, clear Billy. Gail. Yep. Like, I love the movie because it's not only like a slasher. To me, it was like a mystery, especially yeah. watching the PG version. And I'm just trying to figure out like, who could it be? And at one point I'm like, oh, at this point I'm like, it's not Billy. Okay, like I'm not even gonna look at him anymore. Who else? This film, um, for people who are like want to explore more in the horror genre, there's a whole subgenre called Giallo, which is like a kind of esoteric sort of like a lot of the movies are like Italian language films, but they're very whodunit. They're more whodunit, but they're slasher. And yeah. I feel like this is like tipped a little more towards the other edge, but it has a little bit of that feel because they're making you like work the clues. Um, yeah. It's not like a Michael Myers where like Michael did it, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> oh. like clearly it was him, you know, like Freddy Krueger did it, you know, like you always <laughs> know in those movies who did it. But with this, it's like, ooh, we're going to make you hunt this down. Um Okay, so we're going to see Sid go back to school and we're going to get way more information now. Um, Gail wrote a book because she actually thinks that the guy that Sid said killed her mom didn't do it. Um, she thinks that he was framed. Her, his name is Cotton Weary. Um, and she thinks, oh my God, wait a minute. So maybe the killer's on the loose now. So Gail's like, oh, there's a story here. I need to investigate. Um, but we're also learning information that is going to be really good for them to have like a scream two, three, four, five. <laughs> <laughs> like, yep, yep. They're, they're planting a lot of cool stuff in here uh, we're gonna see kids pranking with a ghost face mask because of course um that's what kids are gonna do uh sid's gonna hide in the bathroom and she's gonna overhear some people talking about her and i think so there's a couple references here um there's a girl who they don't know sits there and one of them says teen suicide is out um homicide is a healthier therapeutic expression according to ricky lake so ricky lake was a talk show host of like cd like you know like uh like it, it was your sort of like tabloid talk show kind of thing okay. um and so this is not a good source <laughs> <laughs> um, but also teen suicide is out makes me think of heathers have you heard of heathers yeah, yeah, okay. I haven't seen it in a while, but okay, Winona yeah, writer, right? Yep, Shannon yeah. Doherty, yeah, T Christian Bale, like I'm uh, not Christian That's Bale. Right. Christian oh, no, 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 Slater, Slater um, yeah. is the word that I wanted. Sorry, Christian Bale, not your <laughs> not your movie. Um, <laughs> yeah, so like that was all like sort of a combo of like murdering and teen suicide and you know, like it, it, it uh, there was a whole vibe around that, and I feel like this is speaking to that. Um, and then we're going to get Ghostface battling her in the bathroom because he was there listening to all this too. And she's got skills. skills. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. I would not. I, I just die at that point. If there's Ghostface attacking me, I wouldn't fight back like that. She's so brave. <laughs> I mean, what do you do? Really? Like, I, I mean, in a bathroom? Like, where do you go? I just. Yeah, I'm like, that's it. This is it for me. 
like, well, <laughs> Goodbye, world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty much the same for me too, which is why having watched so many of these films, I try not to put myself in situations like this. Um... <laughs> we know better now i don't want to test these skills for myself because i know i'm <laughs> going to fall very short um okay so if you if you made this movie starring us very short very short film we're drew barrymore <laughs> we're drew um, barrymore, exactly. yeah <laughs> just hang uh, up the phone that's it oh my gosh so we're gonna see okay media are really swarming we're gonna get gail and deputy dewey meeting for the first time and they flirt so much um She's talking about the guys in her age bracket and, and just out of his age bracket being into her. He's like, I was, I was in that age bracket for so long. I, <laughs> I love it. I love the flirting. I'm there like giggling, kicking my feet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so good. Um, there is, uh, okay. So we're going to find out that it's like possible that Sid's dad is a suspect here. And it definitely seems like that uh, even in the police station before. Mm -hmm. um but now we're gonna get to like a whole like huge second act of the well, third act of the film really if drew barrymore is the first one so um we're gonna see that there's a party planned for Stu's house um because if you're gonna if you're gonna set a curfew and you're gonna give people you know time off of school and you know like school's not happening it's too dangerous great party time uh and what better place to do this than at Stu's house uh so that's the plan everybody like vacates the school which gives the killer enough time to kill the principal <laughs> oh henry winkler, i love him protect henry winkler at all costs <laughs> um there's this really like they, they did this cute little nod to a nightmare in elm street here he's like hearing noises he's going out to investigate and then what he sees is a janitor outside who's wearing a full-on freddy krueger sweatshirt that's right. Um, yeah. That's exactly how that character is dressed. Um, and <laughs> it's just like, oh, man. Um, so, OK, so he's going to get, you know, we're going to do the behind the door thing and then he's going to get killed. Um, there's a reflection of like somebody like getting ready to stab him in his eyeball, which is not an exact reference, but makes me think of Strangers on a Train, which is an Alfred Hitchcock film. Um, a really good one, actually, for those who are into that kind of thing. Um, okay, so we're getting schools out for summer. Uh, we're going to get Sid sort of like questioning whether maybe she wasn't right about Cotton Weary. Not sure. Like it's mm -hmm. all getting a little unclear now that it's happening again. Um, and then there, we're going to see that a voyeur is watching them. And this is like very Michael Myers, like who's watching them for this whole thing. And then they make this reference to, I mean, this isn't like some sort of a Wes Carpenter flick. Um, I think they mashed up Wes Craven and John Carpenter there. So director of this film and director of Halloween. Um, I think that's what they were doing there. It's like, a, imagine a world where this was like one person. Yeah, um, okay. I see that. I'm sure it was intentional. I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so we're going to get a ton of meta stuff now at Randy's uh, workplace. So he works at a movie store. They're playing Frankenstein. Um, he's going to confirm that Randy's, uh, Stu's going to confirm that Randy is coming to the party. People are requesting horror movies with him the whole, the whole time. They're like, can I get the howling? Um Billy is standing in the horror section. Randy's like, I can't believe this guy would stand in the horror section. Like, what a way to make yeah, yourself look. <laughs> you're a suspect. Why would, you know, you're a suspect. Why would you be standing in the horror film? I love Randy too. Like he's bringing in all the lore, all dropping in all these um, different movie facts. He's the expert, right? He's the, the horror movie expert and he's, he's so cool. And he's like the, he's aggressively meta. Like he's yeah. so meta, he puts it straight into the dialogue, um, which is so fun. And like as the franchise go go goes on, like they always have to have somebody doing this uh, mm -hmm. to help like move along what they're trying to accomplish in the film. So he's he's really fun. I think it does it land for you if like you aren't really into the genre. I I I I got it. Yeah, I think so. Also, I love Randy. Like it. Yeah, it's so obvious. It's so in your face that I, I just think it's so on brand for his character though he's like the nerdy works at the video store like friend right who's got all the facts and it's just very chaotic and very like paranoid but it works for him and at one point i'm like oh maybe it could be him and they're trying to throw us off right and then eventually we find out that no he really is just like that <laughs> well and like he 
he's definitely pining for Sid the entire film and he's like so annoyed that she's with Billy um <laughs> <laughs> like if nothing else he just wants Billy to be the killer so he can get him out of the way so he can be with Sydney um which too is like that's never gonna happen not gonna happen um but yeah so we've got billy there and uh randy just goes off he's like look the cops do not watch enough horror movies this stuff is standard there's a plot there's a formula like watch prom night that's like uh, your basic jamie lee curtis scream flick um he's like there's always a reason to kill your girlfriend um and uh he's like maybe like what's what's the motive for that i don't know maybe sydney wouldn't have sex with him it's like yeah that well that's happening <laughs> He's figured it out. Yeah, uh, he's nailed it. Um, so Stu is like, I don't know. I think it's her dad because he wants to like throw suspicion off of himself and off of Billy. Uh, Randy's like, nope, his dad's probably her dad's probably dead. Like that's not a character we're going to see. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, so funny because we don't see the dad ever. Like, like the dad until not. the very end of the film. Until the very yeah. end. Yeah, yeah he's yeah, just yeah. not. Yeah he's referenced so much but he's like yeah that's just a red herring it's totally billy billy comes up he's like yeah you were speaking so loud and uh, like how do we know you're not the killer randy's like well i i totally could be like that would make that would be a great outcome for a movie i'd be a prime suspect he's like motive what? it's the millennium motives are incidental yeah yeah <laughs> I that's, just, a, that's a classic quote i don't like the millennium was such a big thing <laughs> i'm sure oh I'm my kidding. god um <laughs> it was like there was it was there was this perception that there was going to be a clear before and after we hit the year 2000 like on the dot like midnight on the year 2000 like it was and it I've was heard about that but was it was it real like did people really believe it yes. like everything was supposed to reset what's what was the name of it there's like a, Y2K. a name well, yeah, just y2k like that mm -hmm. yeah yeah, that people had Y two K parties for the end of the world. I mean, like it's it's like any conspiracy theory, like, but it was much more widely a curiosity than the average conspiracy theory, where like kind of everybody had a Y two K party, regardless of how you felt about the situation. Yeah. And then at midnight, people were like, "Okay, phew, all right, we're <laughs> fine. <laughs> it's all good. The clock's reset." No. <laughs> We had a similar thing in high school when like 2012 was coming up. It was like that kind of like feeling like, oh my God, something's going to happen on 2012. And then, Why 2012? No. What am I missing here? Is it like a religion? I don't know. I'm not super religious, but I think it okay. might've been like a, a biblical, like religious thing, maybe. Okay. Well, I don't know. I, I, I was a child, but okay. <laughs> I feel like it was, it's a similar time. All right. I'm just hearing about this one. I mean, I got to get with the program. Okay. So like, uh, so, so cool. Like when to have these moments where it's just like, it was such a thing, like what's going to happen after this moment. And then like, to be able to separate things into it before and after, which in real time, actually there was no change, <laughs> like no change whatsoever. We all lived our lives, but like in how we perceived it, it was so like, so just to have Randy bringing that in here, um, we're going to get the, town like everybody everything's closing for curfew we're gonna get a song we hear a couple times in this film red right hand by nick cave it feels it feels like an, a classic halloween song and i really associate it with this film um the dude is talking to a cop they actually traced the calls to sydney's dad which clearly like billy and Stu have been added again but we don't know that um and they're sure it's him because tomorrow's the anniversary of his wife's death he's probably unhinged we need to find sydney's dad and sydney's uh Jew is going to stay close to sid just to keep an eye on her and protect her um so we're going to get people driving to the party and i feel like the whole like it's a pretty long stretch of the film that happens after this but like this is like Stu's house is where everything's going on it's like and you just like remember Stu looking at Stu they picked such a cool house for this such a cool house I think it's like on a hill right and it's like mm -hmm. over like, the valley and it's super pretty but it's super ominous because it's a scary movie and you're like oh what's gonna happen here but I feel like looking back it sort of feels like Scream is like a one night it, it's obviously not we this is over several days but so much of it takes place just this one night mm -hmm. uh, 
just at this party and like the house is cool like it has so many different rooms and so many like weird connections between the rooms for people to evade each other and like I I don't know we're just constantly finding a new angle of this house that we never saw before which I think a lot of times when you have a horror movie that's in a house like you run out of things to do if the house isn't interesting enough like the second you get people to an exposed area they're dead so like you have to keep them moving and this film like they picked just the perfect location for this yeah cubbies there's cloth it's, there's the basement the garage like it's all different parts and also again it's in the middle of nowhere of course yeah oh, oh yeah <laughs> like no yeah so we're gonna get the people who've gone to this middle of nowhere location we've got the people who are going to the party dewey is going to drop off sid and tatum which is like know your role it's curfew um <laughs> like you're supposed oh. to be a man of the law um <laughs> Gail is there with her news truck because she knows things are happening and so she uh she's gonna try to she's gonna sidle up to Dewey and be like let me come into the house with you because she wants to plant a camera in there um so which they're gonna do but unfortunately the camera's on 30 second delay which is gonna come Mm -hmm. into play for us later um so we're gonna get tons of randy stuff in in this party he's 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 gonna entertain everybody with a little game how many sequels are in each franchise the evil dead hellraisers he just keeps going through it all like if you tried to watch all of the films they reference in this movie you'd be here forever um sydney is looking through other films that he brought and they're all jamie lucas films they're the fog terror train prom night they're all on vhs Aw, um, it was so cute. Uh, <laughs> just put little tapes in, you have to rewind them later. Um, please be kind, please rewind. Um, so yeah, that was such a thing. Uh, and so Jamie Lee Curtis, what I so one of the things I love about this is like, it's so cool to think that Jamie Lee Curtis was like the final girl, the scream queen when ne- Nev Campbell came around. And then the second Nev Campbell was in this movie, she was like put at the level of Jamie Lee Curtis. And so it's just like, oh, like, you know, like I, like she was instantly in the conversation with this person who was referenced throughout this movie. Yeah, it's so cool. Also, just this one movie, like did it. So you mentioned that it was iconic from like its release. It's crazy. Also, I looked up when it was released and it was like December 20th. I think it was around Christmas time, which is like you know so i would expect it to be released like during halloween time but i mean whatever that that's that's funny yeah it's weird they release they release scary movies all different times a year um it's it's kind of a strange thing but uh yeah this i mean especially because ghost face is so so like it's very clear what you're looking at and it's like you know it was sold in stores everywhere and it was like in the movie it was being sold in stores everywhere and then in real life it was being sold in stores everywhere so like people definitely knew what was happening here uh, I think it really helped that Nev Campbell had been in Party of Five because it was a it was a kind of a long enough running TV show. Um, it was like a, a, a drama, sort of like a primetime drama uh, okay. about a bunch of kids who didn't have parents anymore. Um, and one of and um, Matthew Fox, who was from in Survivor Lost. From Lost. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I was like Party of Five. It sounds familiar. I'm watching Lost right now for the Ooh. first time ever. So I think I looked up where he, yeah, what other stuff he was in and Party of Five. That's right. Okay. So Party of Five is very different from Lost, but he is like a very important character. He is like the oldest and he ends up having to sort of like take care of all of the kids whose parents are now not, I think they die at the beginning or they've already oh. died and he's like become their guardian. Um, and so, it, but it's just, but he's not that much older than him. So it's like this really interesting sort of familial drama um it's like more than a teen drama but a teen drama at the same time um and it was popular yeah it was popular for sure and I think that's how you end up getting Matthew Fox and Lost and then after Lost I think he's like I've kind of done enough um (laughs) like he was on TV for so many years I can just retire like (laughs) yeah he had been at it for a while he did some movies after that for sure Um, he might he might still be doing some things but he's like we we don't see him as much on TV because it's like such a especially stuff like that it was like 20 plus episodes a season and they were like constantly filming so um but yes okay so uh that's a little bit of the backstory on that but yeah Jamie Lee Curtis Nev Campbell in the same conversation now I prefer Nev um (laughs) (laughs) 
what can I say? Um, okay, Stu's gonna ask Tatum to get him a beer. We wanna kill another person here. <laughs> so, but in meanwhile, he's gonna be occupied by getting the door. Gail Weathers is there, she's gonna plant the camera. So we're gonna see what's up with Tatum. She's getting the beer. So many references here. Um, we're gonna get some fun with automatic garage door openers and cat doors. Uh, ghost is she again another person who thinks ghost face is randy and mm -hmm. ghost face is not randy um but she's like totally making fun of the situation she's like oh this is cute what movie is this from i spit on your garage which this is a reference that i need to give people a trigger warning about because if you go to watch i spit on your grave it is um a a horror movie that involves like the longest series of rape scenes I have ever. Oh my God. Like know it going in. If you're doing the home game of watching all the films that are referenced here, just that one, I think need, you know, like people need to know, like be careful around that one. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so Tatum references that one. And then she's like, don't kill me, Mr. Ghostface. I want to be in the sequel. Um, <laughs> Iconic. Uh, Another iconic line forever. And of course she doesn't make the sequel. Sure doesn't. She's not oh, gonna live past like another minute. Cut Casper, <laughs> that's a wrap. She, yeah. uh, what's your favorite kill in this movie? My favorite kill? If you measure things in such a way. <laughs> <laughs> that might Melissa, be a very horror movie way. I think I am. <laughs> <laughs> like I have answers to those questions, but I, I need to remember that not all normal humans do. Yeah. Um, I guess the the one that I mean Casey's at the very beginning mm -hmm. would be like the most iconic. Other than that, yeah, I feel like the principal is eh. Later we see, you know, Gail and her assistant, like her assistant. Yeah, I don't think any of them really stand out to me. So the girlies, so Tatum's and Casey's deaths. Yeah. Would be yeah. my favorites. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as That's favorite what kills them. go. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think Tatum's is just like- It's weird. It's so it's, weird, yeah. Ugh, like- It's like excellent use of the house. Like the, the this is a so garage slow. with a cat door in it. Yeah, it's so slow too. Like you feel it coming and it's just, she's going up and up. And I'm like, first off, is that how it really works? Like- It, it feels a thousand percent preventable, you know? Yeah. You would like, think it just wouldn't move with like a hundred pounds holding it down. But. Sure. Yeah. And I feel like, can you not just hunch your shoulders and squeeze back out? If you got <laughs> in, it's not like putting on a ring that you can't take off. You know, like yeah. I, I don't know. Um, but despite all that, I mean, it's fun to know that she's not getting out of the situation. And like, it's such a violent, like kind of moment. <laughs> where you're just like, wow. Um, so she's just going to be stuck literally in the garage door for the entire the rest of the night. night. Yeah, they just forget about her. <laughs> yeah, they're <laughs> like, where's Tatum? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think they sort of mentioned it. They're like, oh, I don't know. She's going down getting beer still. Oh my gosh. But that's the beauty of like having a house that has so many places to be because they can go through the whole film and not know how much danger they're in. Because um, we get this kill and we know everybody's in danger, but everybody else is like, oh, it's a party. Um, so, okay. People are starting to leave for curfew, uh, but Billy arrives at this point because he doesn't care about curfew. Why would he care about curfew? You know, really? Um, he wants to talk to Sid. They're going to go to the bedroom. Randy is like, <laughs> oh, Randy. Um, he actually says, What's Leatherface doing here? Which is the villain from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, and, you know, Randy knows exactly what Billy's about. Okay. Uh, <laughs> he knows his stuff, obviously. And he, he knows he's on to him. I'm wondering if you got this reference. Randy is is like well there goes my shot when he like goes upstairs with Sid when Billy goes upstairs with Sid and Stu says as if yeah I, oh I didn't realize that it was a reference but it's from Hello, Clueless, Clueless. Yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 um which is weird like they just pile in so many references here Clueless was just like also instantly massive Alicia yeah. Silver Alicia Silverstone was like like the it girl right away and I always got a feeling like she's kind of Nev Campbell-ish actually. Like, 
I always got a feeling that she was like, yeah, I'm just here to like save the, the environment and like, uh, like protect dogs. And like, she, she just wasn't, it wasn't her thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, besides this movie, I really can't, I don't remember anything else that she was in. Uh, Clu- I'm talking about Clueless. I'm talking about Alicia, but yeah. Yeah. She's in some stuff, but like, if you're only in Clueless, everybody knows you from Clueless, you know, like it's just, yeah. Um, but so, okay. So we're going to find out that Gail's assistant, Kenneth is watching the the footage from the party. It's got that delay. That's going to be helpful for us later when we kill him. <laughs> um, Sid and Billy, she's saying things like, you know, I don't want to turn out like my mom. I don't want to be the bad seed. That's another horror movie reference. He's going to give her one of his own. He's like, well, you know, like, he makes reference to Jodie Foster in Silence of the Lambs having flashbacks of her dead father. He's like, mm-hmm. it's all one big, great movie. You can't pick your genre. Uh, she says she wants it to be a Meg Ryan movie or maybe a good porno. And they're going to do it. And so she's no longer going to be a virgin. Um, but yeah, I mean, like Meg Ryan had a lot of really big films that were coming out. Earlier in the film, they, they uh, referenced... Like, I'd rather have, have Meg Ryan play me. I definitely wouldn't want Tori Spelling. And Tori Spelling, I, I don't know if you know, like... I know, it, she was in 90210, right? She was. And there was just this, like, she was Aaron Spelling's daughter. And there was this, it was really, really mean. Like, the 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 conversation, the, the, the vibe around Tori Spelling, the way people referred to her very commonly was that she was unattractive and couldn't act. But because her father was Aaron Spelling she got a role in 90210 and was this big star so it was like like she was became synonymous with like people who shouldn't be nepo baby like a bad nepo baby it was nepo baby before we used the words nepo baby for sure um so it was sort of like and it's so funny because Tori Spelling is going to be in this movie franchise so like okay she's gonna come in for a sequel later she really like I, I like that she was able to sort of laugh at herself and the situation but yeah. it could not be easy to be her like in that way I so look I've only seen I saw the scream recently I haven't seen the sequels I'm gonna watch them for sure this October and I'll point her out because I totally didn't catch the Tori spelling or I don't remember her just like a just not not for like a full movie part I don't yeah. think um if I'm remembering right but like she to in any way step foot in a franchise that just like perpetuated the especially that this movie is gonna be yeah, so like, big yeah. yeah like okay. and then here we are all these years later and I'm like did you know um <laughs> so you know, she wasn't voted in on Dancing with the Stars this last weekend uh she was the first eliminated yeah it was a public vote so that's why I have like Terry Tori Spelling like in my mind like fresh I'm like oh I know what she looks like yeah she just Aww. got voted out <laughs> I wonder if this is still following her in her life I just I don't know um <laughs> that's such that's bad news for her um so in the living room as we're going to get like the sex scene between belly but billy and said we're going to see randy like really breaking down the rules for us and the first Mm -hmm. one is you have to be a virgin in horror movies if you want to live um uh, (laughs) so oh well so much for that he's like you also can't drink or do drugs everybody's like yeah (laughs) at the party he says and you can never say i'll be right back um and so those are the rules he's just telling you what they are um so Dewey and Gail are gonna go on a little walk they're gonna look for a car in the bushes might be Sid's dad's car uh we're gonna see kids leaving the party they uh they haven't seen Tatum not not really worried about it they're gonna leave anyway uh Mm -hmm. we're gonna cut back and forth between Sid and Billy and then we're gonna see like Randy getting a call to find out that the principal is dead which who called about this like like I, I at night too like I, yeah. yeah yeah I just all right fair enough again I'm like it could go back to it being a small town and mm-hmm. this is like a big deal obviously these murders happening is kind of a big deal so yeah oh yeah for I, I sure. who calls him. is it the school that calls him or like I don't know that we know who calls him we just know that he's getting the information and he's like <laughs> guys it's getting serious now the principal's dead it's like the okay (laughs) like it was pretty serious before all that um but goodness uh but they care about the principal and that's nice uh so uh so okay 
Halloween music is playing. The Halloween music from the movie is playing in the background. That movie is playing. Um, the rest of the partiers just sort of leave Randy there. Um, and then Kenneth is going to be watching like Randy get stalked by Ghostface. And then we don't know what happens part. to him. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I love what? this part because Randy's just watching and you see Ghostface creeping up behind him and he's yelling at the screen like no run like no he's like look behind you look behind you and then he like realizes that then he gets attacked so it's again like the meta of it all like while it's happening is super cool yeah so uh just like so meta everything about that character really advances that for me um okay so billy and sid have done the deed and sid has it occurs to her you know you could have used your one phone call to call me from the police station. That would have been smart. And he's like, come on, you don't believe me. And then Ghostface is going to come in and stab him. So it's like, okay. Like, I do wonder how much, like, I, I can't imagine that uh, Stu is just like waiting on the other side of the door for when the, the moment that city figures it out, but it's yeah. very well timed here where it's like, he needs another alibi. <laughs> Yeah, yep. like must have right alibi. Is getting suspicious. Oh my gosh. Um, so she's gonna hide. She's like running through rooms in the house. It's like, how do these rooms even connect to each other at this point? Um, and so she goes into an extra bedroom. She's gonna go, she's gonna like work her way out onto the roof. I love it when movies use roofs, and then she's like, you know, ghost face tries to get her. And she's going to fall backwards. And you're like, no, she's dead. She's dead. And she falls onto a boat bed. <laughs> she should be seriously injured. Like, are you For kidding sure. me? I, still, like, she still fell off from, like, two stories up. Uh, that's got to hurt. Like, And maybe I just don't know enough about boats. But I feel like uh, it's not like she landed on a mattress. Like, it feels like it would be, like, seats and stuff. And, st like, you know, like, you land on something that's not the shape of a human. Um exactly but i mean oh. perfectly perfectly placed i mean talk about perfection and this is important because she now needs to see that tatum is in the garage <laughs> like right. in yep. the garage right in front of her yeah so uh it's all like it's escalating for sid at this point um we are going to see sid run to kenneth in the truck um and he's going to get his throat slit as they're watching randy be stalked by ghostface on time delay Yep. But she is going to escape and she and Dewey are somehow reunited now and they're going to go, they, uh, no, sorry, Gail and Dewey are going to run up to the house. Uh, Dewey is going to go inside and be the hero for five minutes. Um, <laughs> there's, he's looking around, nobody is in the living room. Uh, Gail finds nobody in the van, but then she finds like a pool of blood from her assistant, which is never mm -hmm. good. She's going to get her cellular uh, and she's going to call 911 and Randy's going to come up. She's going to beat him with the phone because that's how big the phones were. We're not talking <laughs> stuff like this. We're talking you can knock a person out with your cellular phone. Um, it looks like a brick. Yeah. It's, it was a brick. There was no such thing as putting this thing in your pocket. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we were just a step away from a landline phone where you had to like physically pick up the phone everywhere you went and had a cord attached to the wall. <laughs> Like, that's what we were coming from some people got it like got to a point where they had a phone that like was a cordless uh that was cool but it's still like docked yep. in a certain place okay. it was wild so bulky. oh my god um so okay so uh where's kenneth he's on top of gail's car she is going to try to throw him off of the car while she's driving it she's just so freaked out about the situation um Sydney is shouting for Dewey. He stumbles out of the house and oh no, like he's been stabbed. Um, when you were watching, the, do you remember when you were watching this? Did, do you remember who you thought it was? At this point, oh, I figured maybe like Stu. The, I'm trying to think, it was, it was a few years back, but I think it was Stu at this point. Because I had right? said that because thing earlier Billy that he had dated. Alibi. Yeah. Yeah. Billy was stabbed. And then we didn't see Stu for a while. I think it was, yeah, I think it was Stu. Or at some point, Randy. 
but then it, it didn't make sense once Randy got attacked. But I never thought, oh, it's two people. Like not once did it cross my mind. It was such an inventive way to do it. Like I, I just don't like films didn't really do that kind of thing. And stalker films, or or like stalker or slasher films didn't do that kind yeah. of thing usually. So it was just this really interesting way to play with it. Um, okay, so uh, Dewey has been stabbed. Ghostface is there. He takes the knife. And he goes, and he wipes the blood off. I like. I just feel like what what kind of absorbent material? Uh, it's just like a perfectly clean knife every time he wipes it off. Um, and then we're going to see. I I think this is such a cool scene where Sid's going to try to hide from Ghostface in the car. She like locks the door. She gets inside, and he's like stalking her, and then he disappears. And you're like, oh my god. <laughs> just like, like that in feeling. the car too yeah and then he it's opens scary. up the hatchback and she doesn't see it and she's trying to get on the radio it's so like so effectively builds that tension especially just to see him disappear it's like you knew where he was i know we don't see him anymore and oh i um, hate the suspense but it's fun right but i mean you know something's gonna happen but she actually does kick herself free from Ghostface. And then we're going to get this really cool moment where we're going to get Randy and Stu running up to the house at the same time. Sid's got the gun and they're both like, it wasn't me. It was him. No, it was him. It was me. It was him. No. Um, And she's just like, I don't know who it is, but I'm closing the door on both of you. Figure it out. Yeah, that that's Sid, right? Like that's Sydney. That's Sydney Prescott for you. Like she's, I wouldn't take my chances either. I'd be like, like. I don't, you know, screw these guys. Like, there's just no test you can really do at this point to, like, figure out who it is in an, any sort of reasonable amount of time that's going to keep you safe. So it's just like, nope, sort it out. I'm out. <laughs> and so she's going to then see Billy. He's alive, sort of, and he falls down the stairs. It's like, oh, oh, oh. And he's totally faking I it. I believe it at this point. Oh, oh, no, Billy. Like, poor Billy. Oh, it's like they had this great love story <laughs> happening. Um, he only slightly like made her feel bad about not having sex with him because of her mom dying a year before earlier in the film. That's like we are past that now. <laughs> he, a whole um, hour. Yeah. yeah, we're a whole hour past that. So she uh she's gonna uh, Randy's gonna come in. Uh, he's, he's somehow won whatever happened outside with Stu um, and he, Randy's like Stu's gone a little mad Billy the turn fully happens here he's like we all go a little mad sometimes full psycho reference um, and so like he's he's got the gun now and he's super dangerous he's gonna shoot Randy um, mm -hmm. he, he's like ah see how we did this this was corn syrup like Carrie, the movie Carrie with the pig's blood. Um, yep. So, okay, it's Billy, but it's also Stu. Oh my God. <laughs> the big reveal, I was like, oh my God. I was like, I should have seen, I should have known. Hello, it's always the boyfriend and their besties and something was clearly wrong with Stu, but it, it's such a great, such a fun reveal. Also, the, the switch, like Billy and Stu just like switching into like, the bad guy mode yeah um he really had been the bad guy obviously like the bad boyfriend but like seeing him as the killer and act like the killer i'm like ah oh, this is scary yeah so so good and like also it's just so smart because they had given them both an alibi for one of the kills at least one of the kills so you're like it can't be because if it, you did that you could have done this but you couldn't have done this one and so to make it two people it throws all of us off who are watching because we don't expect it to be two people um so they've and got a voice like, right so we get these two and you're like why like what is going on and then yeah they go i mean that's that's really the key problem to solve here i mean we, it's, it's all fun and games to figure out like the tricks, the magic tricks of it, the voice disorder and all of that. But like, why, why all of this? Um, Sid's like, you'll never get away with this. Billy's like, we'll tell that to Cotton Weary, like who we framed. <laughs> She's like, wait, what? Yep. Um, <laughs> like, oh my God. He's like, she's like, why? He's like, I don't believe in motives. Uh, Cause Norman Bates didn't have one. Hannibal Lecter and Silence of the Lambs didn't have one. Don't need one. Um, he says, your mom was a whore like Sharon Stone. Stu's like, yeah, but your mom was no Sharon Stone. Um, Sharon Stone, I think, was a friend of Wes Craven's. 
So oh, I guess it was okay. like uh, a nice nod to her in some way. Billy gives us a really thin reason for him to be doing all of this. He's like, see, your mom slept with my dad. She's like, <laughs> this is it. it uh, also, it comes out of nowhere. And also we know that they drag or like this is very important for like the rest of the the franchise or like they keep bringing it up but yeah it's like what what is going on she just gets hit with all of this information her boyfriend's the bad guy oh her boyfriend's been killing all these people oh he also killed her mom like it, it's so much and cotton weary's moment. been innocent all this time it's like yeah which we don't really know i think we've seen like his face on tv maybe Con mm -hmm. but like we don't really know who that is yeah um, but yeah because yeah. we're gonna i mean uh, patience in time you know we're gonna work that out over the next however many movies in this franchise uh but he's, he's like yeah your mother slept with my dad she's the reason my mom moved out and abandoned me look that's an upsetting thing to have happen to you i get it yeah. and i don't want to minimize that in any way billy but like <laughs> this is not a standard reaction to that so yeah. it's she's sid's I like mean, they're what? just saying yeah yeah I, it's a lot of information to take in like that's already like gonna rock your world just by itself and then to be like but how did it lead to this you know like at the same time my goodness um so billy is saying oh, well it's the anniversary of her mom's death and so that's i guess why all this flare-up is happening right now Stu is gonna bring sid's dad out because they've they've had him for the whole film um and they're like here's the plan it's so good we're gonna frame everything on this man and we're gonna be the only survivors uh we're gonna be wounded but we're gonna be survivors and that's the move so they start stabbing each other billy and Stu do and it just gets totally unhinged this like Stu, some of the best lines from Stu are coming in ar around this point <laughs> Um, feeling a little woozy here you know <laughs> yeah. he's like stop it man I get it like please stop <laughs> it gets like it brings you back to like they are just teenagers and they're stupid and the, like yes very evil but very flawed yeah and they're kind of they're laying out this entire plan for them before killing them and it's like again why just to brag about committing this you know all of these murders they're just dumb well and like thank goodness they're dumb because like they're they're so like focused on stabbing each other that meanwhile sydney who's smart is like well i'm going to use the distraction they're providing me to basically like remove my dad from the situation remove myself grab the gun <laughs> yeah they're, they're just like, foolish and you see it throughout the entire movie too which is what i like about scream is that like it is just like a human under that mask. It's nothing like supernatural or crazy. And they can be defeated, you know, when she's running away from them and she outsmarts them by jumping through a window and jumping off the roof or like kicking them down the stairs. It's like, you know, they are, Ghostface is just dumb. Like they are flawed. Yeah. I mean, inherently, there's something very unhinged and very like unplanned about their action like they're planning them but how far ahead can you actually plan these things that they're doing so they're gonna get sloppy and my goodness the hubris um so <laughs> like yeah. you know sid is kind of gets herself away from the situation she grabs a voice disorder she's gonna call uh billy's gonna give the phone to Stu. <laughs> He's like, wait, you called the police? Like, where are you hiding right now? My mom and dad are going to be so mad at me. <laughs> um, she actually, she says, are you alone in the house to start with? And it's like such a great turn. You're like, yes, yep. Sid. Um, Billy is so angry. He goes to look for her, which this always makes me crack up. He just goes to the living room and starts tearing up pillows with a knife. Like, <laughs> she's definitely not in the couch cushions. He's not in the couch cushions, <laughs> like if there's one place she isn't it's the place you're checking uh he does check the closet at least there's that um and but unfortunately that is where she's hiding so we're gonna get this like moment of jamie lee curtis hiding in the closet in halloween and then we're gonna get sid popping out of the closet as ghost face she sort of stabs at him with an umbrella just trying to like get him out of the way um Stu's gonna attack her she's gonna kill him with a tv total nod to nightmare on elm street three um okay one of the very creative kills of that one. Um, Randy is alive. 
Yay! He's not the like we know who the bad guys are. It's not Randy, and he's happy to be a virgin so he could be alive. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Billy is also alive right now, and so he's going to attack Sid. Gail's going to shoot. Well, she's actually going to shoot him this time. She tried to shoot him before the safety was on. This time, she's going to be effective with the kill. And uh, yeah, so then we're going to get Sid kicking Stu. And we're going to get the the sort of the moment that I always think of now when I'm watching horror. It's, it's movies like this that made future horror movies less scary to me because Randy is like, this is the moment the supposedly dead killer comes back to life for one last scare. And then yeah. like, ah! and she and Sid shoots him and kills him. Um, it's like every every time there's a movie with a moment like this now where you just get this long shot of the person who's supposed to be dead. I'm like thinking of this line um yeah, because i'm like you're gonna come back they're gonna come back somehow that and that's it. what i brandy's like you gotta shoot them in the head right like that's his his advice yeah oh yeah i mean he knows if we had just listened to randy from the beginning we might have prevented a lot of this um and then uh you know the dad also pops out of the closet i guess sydney was protecting him by standing in front of him when she popped out of it so like they didn't keep looking for him for the dad but yeah, we've got some survivors. We've got Dewey, we've got Gail, we've got Sid, we've got Randy, we've got the dad. Um, and Gail's going to report on this thing. And um, I mean, that's she got her story. She did. She finally, she was there. She got her story. The movie ends with her like reporting live from the scene. <laughs> and she earned it. I mean, <laughs> this 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 woman had to do some work to get this story beyond the normal. Um, I mean, and I do love like as the franchise goes on, like the, these characters are such legacy characters and they're really honored, especially the mm-hmm. further you get into the franchise. So, um, I mean, it's so, so fun. Um, so, OK, I've been asking people to rate these movies based on how scary they think they are like on a scale of let's say like one to ten where would you put this especially as somebody who isn't really into scary movies so like one being very like the lowest end ten being the highest okay I would say like a four Hmm. like we're talking about somebody that's like really scaredy, like scaredy cat, doesn't like movies at all. I would maybe say a three or a four. Okay. I all right. I think it's very low. It's more suspense than anything. Mm-hmm. The only reason I'm like, okay, I'll bump it up to a four. I just don't like the gory stuff, the guts spilling out in the first like 10 minutes. But other than that, like, again, the knife stays relatively clean throughout the movie. Mm-hmm. You know, they make sure to wipe it after every kill. <laughs> and it's it's not too bad I don't think it's super scary I like if I can do it then I think anybody can do it okay well that's that's good news so for the folks who are not so sure this one is like probably pretty safe to go into um so yeah but actually I'd love to hear that from everybody who's watching this so rate this on your scary meter you know like I said I'm totally desensitized to horror movies now so this helps to make sure that recommendations remain appropriate uh in the future like what's your favorite kill what's your oh what's yeah I mean not, not normal people don't ask questions like that but I have answers okay um like I'm doing 31 days worth of answers to questions like this so um yeah but whether you are or not just just rate it and we'll see where it's sort of like the average lands and that might help any of us who need to make recommendations figure out like okay where does this one actually fall um okay so next time for those who are following along uh, day by day we are going to watch when a stranger calls uh which is something i talked about a little bit at the start of this film this for day six of the 31 days of scary movies that film is actually from 1979 so like it's very suspenseful it's a psychological film and like the opening 20 minutes are like I think what get referenced the most in, in future films and certainly is referenced in this film. So it's really, really fun. Um, I co- When I rewatched it covering for this, I had a kind of a different feeling about it than I had the first time I watched it. So that was really fun to discover. Um, so I'm curious to know what people think about that one. But yeah. Wait, quick, what would you rate that one when a stranger calls? You said it's more of a thriller. Mis- like so... Mystery let me ask you this um 
because my rating is honestly worth nothing. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> no, I'm like, I'm scared to ask, but it sounds good. And I mean, like you said, when a stranger calls, I'm assuming it's like the bad guy calling, right? And like mm -hmm. maybe killing. Whatever Which you know, it. and that's not even a spoiler to say, like you, it's very clear from the very beginning. It's a movie that's sort of like in three parts that feel okay. very distinct to me. And I didn't like that the first time I watched the film, but the, the, when I watched it for this, I was like, I think it, I think it kind of works. Um, it's, it's heavily suspenseful. It is, what kind of scary movies do you steer totally clear of? You said gore, is that fair? I don't like, yeah, gore and like, like I said, like demonic or anything with like spirits and stuff. Like I've never watched like The Conjuring or anything like that. I feel like that's too scary. This might work for you. So like it's it's got no supernatural elements to it. It doesn't have gore. Um, they talk about gore, but they don't show you gore. So like it could it could work. And um, if the first like watch the first 20 minutes and if you like it, watch the rest of the film uh okay is kind okay, of the I, thing like, I'm into it like I I'm in the the October vibe you yes. know um, so I don't watch scary movies I do read the plots Ooh. so I actually just read the Texas Chainsaw Massacre plot because I was like oh I'm just interested and I mean people rave about that movie and say yeah. that it's like one of the best like scary movies ever um and it sounded okay I would never I wouldn't watch it Okay, I was like, I don't know if that's the first one I'd send you to. I actually would no. recommend A Nightmare on Elm Street for you. Okay. Okay. Because so I'm like, I can read plots just fine. Watching is a whole different thing. But... Yeah. I mean, because A Nightmare on Elm Street, there are a couple moments where they have, like, kills that are absurdly, like, it, it's like, no way there's that much blood coming out of a human like it's it's like it's like that's not it you know like it's it's like definitely not um but it also has like a lot of that like freddy krueger is the sort of villain that people cheer when he comes on screen and he's snarky and he's got one-liners and he's like he like talks? I don't he, know he talks he does a lot of these films the the guy the, the whoever stalking doesn't talk but Freddy Krueger has some lines um oh. and he's 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 like yeah he uh he has some sass and so like people celebrate him now um and it's like in a way that I think kind of feels a little bit like this film so like it's it's a different plot for sure like they're playing with dreams and stuff like that and he is more of a supernatural figure but at the same time he has a human form so it's like Okay. So okay. could could be an avenue you go down, but we can we can I'll I can make a couple other day. recommendations. Yeah, I'll watch it during the daytime of anything. <laughs> that sounds fair. Yeah. I mean, do October responsibly is what I say. You know, <laughs> it's the first time I've ever said it, but I feel like it's something I can say moving forward. Um yeah. but okay, so like uh be before we wrap up, like what what's happening for you? What do you want to plug? I know you've got some things going on. Yeah, so I recently launched this new Bachelor podcast. I'm not a scary movie girly. I am a reality TV girly, and I love The Bachelor. Everything Bachelor Nation, I've watched it for years, and I'm so excited to have a podcast where I get to sit down with, like, reality TV icons and talk about The Bachelor. I recently had Rachel Riley, and I had Taylor Hale before that. I talked to Demi Burnett, who's a Bachelor Nation icon. So that's out every Thursday at americatellsall.com. You can go and subscribe there. Other than that, I'm just watching Big Brother 26 now. The finale is coming up. I'm super excited about that. And I won't be in LA, but I am hosting a watch party here in Nashville. So if anybody's in the area, that's happening at New Heights Brewery. Yeah, I think that's the name of it. Um, but yeah, you can find tickets online. So cool. A lot of really fun things happening in your world. And I'm telling you, you guys need to check out this podcast because America like debuted at number one. I mean, that doesn't <laughs> happen by accident. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Um, and for those who are into Eektober and want to watch more of the films, you know, check out, there's a full list of the films that I've got on, you know, slated for each day in the description of the video. I hope you'll join me again. Happy Eektober, everybody. Get spooky, get donuts. <laughs> Bye.